Sometimes there aren't storms here. We can enjoy the wonders of this breathtaking coastline. A five minute drive down south, we hop into the warm seawater for a swim in a very beautiful place with our friends Roko and Tommy. Here at Laguna Yalku, we weren't sure what to expect, but when we started swimming past a bit of soft coral and sea life, we knew that we had found one of these few remaining natural, delicate playgrounds. Some goofy moss balls or marimo to play with. Or some lionfish to pester. Actually, careful with the lionfish. The spines or barbs along its back and on its belly can pack a nasty venomous punch. This little guy is politely telling Robbie to F off by nonchalantly showing his back end and fanning out the spines. There's an abundance of grazing fish, particularly colorful parrotfish, cleaning away at the algae-covered reef and rock, even with a fair bit of visitors swimming around in the water. Lots of damselfish and snapper spawning in the mangrove fish nursery. Our friend Rocco is a cave snorkeling enthusiast, so he checks out all of the crags and crevices looking for that perfect spot to squeeze into. It's a little bit unnerving for the uninitiated, because we know that there are lots of critters using those cracks already. But here we go, through the short tunnel, popping out on the other side where these ragged rock formations are everywhere. We all take turns filming with our boat neighbor's borrowed GoPro 8. Robbie's kind of territorial about it. But it's a good thing he took the camera for this shot, because I looked into this next cave and thought, Nuh uh. Yeah, I thought long and hard about going into this cave. The mixing fresh and salty water was quite murky, especially near the top, and the rays of light representing the exit on the other side of the tunnel. I'm behind the bit, don't worry are not immediately visible as you enter. Tommy cheered me on. But we came to a compromise. Robbie and I would go together. The water is freakishly warm here, and yet the fish are scurrying about, cleaning the algae amongst the legs of swimming tourists. It's also brackish, part salty, part fresh, so it is somewhat uninhabitable by most of these species of fish. But life finds a way. I'm always amazed by these little guys' courage and pluckiness. They are lucky that Robbie came here today unarmed, without the spear gun, because you'd know he'd be after them. Back to reality here at our boat, where this season we've weathered several tropical storms, cyclones, preceded by tornadoes and water spouts, and most recently a dud hurricane. So we, uh, we're going to change the, the system when the shaft comes into the boat, the engine comes, we're going to take the chance to remove the so-called dry... Uh, dripless. Dripless bearing. Which and drips very much. much. And we're going to put an ordinary packing, packing stuffing box and, see, and close off the front area so all the water will stay inside this area with the pump. And the shaft is just this. Yeah, that's the shaft. So everything on the end of that you're wanting off. Yes. You're gonna get a new connection between the engine and the shaft. Yeah. That bolt's never. We're never gonna, gonna get that undone. None of that is is 
probably gonna be salvageable. Yeah. Usually there's the, the shaft, there's some space, and then there's a, a pipe that's usually a quarter inch thick. So the the actual fiberglass pipe that comes out, which which this uh, is attached to, is gonna be bigger than the shaft. So here he is measuring the propeller shaft log, or stern tube, the fiberglass where the shaft enters the boat, and the shaft itself, for a new stuffing box. Closest thing is an inch and a quarter. It's just a fraction shorter than an inch and a quarter. What's millimeters then? It is probably metric. It's 30 millimeter exactly. Along with preparing for an engine, we've been slowly preparing to acquire some batteries. Our dear patrons have supplied us with these electrical wires, connectors, fuses, and charging items, of course. Uh, switch panel. This is a fuse bar, and this is a negative ground bar. You have the wires coming, you have the positives going here, and then all the negatives going here. And from here, they go into the switches. In the meantime, we can run the wires which will mean drilling big fat holes into the walls that I have spent so much time patching up with epoxy throughout the last year. Hopefully it will not be so many though, because we don't have many electronics to wire in. Where are we going to put lay the pipes? How many wires and how many sections are we going to separate the boat? Yeah, we only have bilge pumps. Yeah, bilge pumps and the, and the strips, strips of uh, LED lights. With no switches for now, I still don't know how it switches. Well, yeah, they'd have to be wired to the switchboard directly so we could have one switch and you just turn on all the lights in the boat. No, we don't have to find some switches. We have a chart plotter waiting for yeah, us on our friend's boat. The lights on the, the navigation lights. The port side of our boat has a copper propane line running from the stern to the center of the interior of our boat. And now the starboard side will have an electrical backbone running from the new panel to the bow of the boat. This backbone will be our way of keeping most of the electrical wire neat and tidy, as well as protecting it from moisture, and it adds fire resistance. But enough of these pesky, necessary boat projects. Time for another hurricane. This means running some long ropes across to the other side of the canal once the harbour has been shut by the harbour master and the boat traffic has ceased for the storm. We get some last minute storm jitters and run some extra lines to the dock as night falls as well. Robbie pretending like he's not hearing that. <laughs> kind of, I'm like, if you don't look at it, it's just gonna blow, leave us alone, but no. I was nervous about leaving Robbie alone on the boat last time and Choco is happier to be with him as well. So this is the size of the garlic I'm allowing this time. That's all I'm allowing for this environment. So it's dinner time aboard in Esperado. Just some simple leftover filled tacos tonight. It's really thick. This new packaging in the grocery stores here in Mexico tells us... I'm just gonna wait for the howling to stop. We were expecting the worst of the storm between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. And the forecast was accurate this time, with the wind picking up around 10. Mm. They call this a flauto in Mexico, a, a flu. Flauto. The charter catamaran across the way was visited throughout the evening by her caretakers. Oof. Yeah. That guy just jumped onto the catamaran. The catamaran is like 10 feet off of the wall. They've got it way out. And I could see they had a surfboard or a paddleboard. You have to go onto the paddleboard to then get onto the catamaran. And he just made a leap and almost didn't make it onto the cat. I saw them use many other methods to get onto that boat, including climbing on all fours up the dock lines. Wind speeds were building up towards 65 knots, or 120 kilometers an hour, or 75 miles per hour. We were trying to rest up inside, just like any other evening. The caretaker of the boat next to us was also aboard and used the handy dandy spotlight to keep an eye out on everybody around, including Robbie, who put his rain jacket on and was now checking lines. Our neighbor, alone aboard her 45 footer, was surely nervous about the weather, so Robbie checked on her lines as well. Careful, Ismail. 
He's standing on, on the front of his boat. Woo! It hit us as a category one hurricane. Not strong enough to lift up heavy objects or to blow you away, but just strong enough to cause worry. But Choco was glad to be with his best bud and I was glad to be inside, dry and warm. Midnight marked the halfway point through the storm, and like a New Year's celebration, I popped open the kombucha bubbly. While you are working on, on getting this wheel spinning, I guess we can take the chance to reflect on our experiences of having been through several small hurricanes this season. <laughs> Well, that was like three in a month almost. Well, technically only two of them two were hurricanes. Yeah, they were like two and a half hurricanes. Uh, some water spouts, uh, tornadoes, yeah. and several tropical, well, lots of tropical depressions and several tropical storms. And we've been reflecting on how we're, we're living in a world with more and more hurricanes each year and more devastating sized hurricanes over time. So I think it's worth considering the concept of hurricane safety what we'll have to deal with in the next coming years in the coming years yeah this is not a guide or anything this is just some things we've observed having been in the several little hurricanes number one what's number one get out <laughs> yeah don't be in a hurricane path if you can help it that's yeah. our number one kind of rule which we are breaking but not by choice we're just kind of marooned here with the boat yeah if any situation arises where there's a hurricane barreling your way. Me, I think Justin too agrees that possibly the best thing is to get out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Travel south or north, depending on which atmosphere you are, and just get out of the way if possible. I mean, that's definitely their first choice. Second would possibly be tie down, batten up, and hang on to your butt, which is, <laughs> <laughs> which is the, what <laughs> many people do, is that they just find the nearest crack somewhere and put the boats in and tie it down with any possible rope yeah so we're we're lucky because we have a kind of a mangrove type habitat here on yeah. Mayan Riviera it's it's not really a mangrove I mean it's it used to be a mangrove now it's just houses along a canal but originally mangroves were kind of the natural deterrent or natural safe spot from hurricanes and we do have a little bit of mangrove left here on the property where our boat is tied up so we're lucky. I, I do believe that the mangrove blocked a lot of the wind yeah. that we would have experienced otherwise. And they're actually a, a good point of attachment. It, and we don't want to attach our boat to the mangrove because we don't want to break the mangrove. But you have lots and lots of trees to attach your boat to. And if you cannot attach yourself to just one point, yeah, you're giving yourself more safety. Mangroves usually are natural surge preventers, so... Yeah, they're, an, they're an ecologically... Uh, Designed system to prevent yeah. surges, basically. They protect whatever's behind. That's the second point. Lots and lots of three-strand rope, nice and stretchy, even the nylon, the poly, just lots and lots and lots of that. Of course, uh, if you don't have that, if you don't have meters and hundreds of meters yes. of that kind of rope, you use anything available to you. So as the category of hurricane grows, so does the wind speed. Yeah. I, I don't know what the actual wind speed is scientifically that would be objects flying through the air or other items flying through the air, other boats, uh, parts of houses. At some point, the wind speed is high enough that objects can start flying through the air and then that becomes a danger. Yeah. Not just the surge. The no. wave also is a very important thing to be, you want to make absolutely sure that you never get hit by, by waves because that constant, that's what causes chief and... Sorry, yeah, fly. it's the waves that are very critical when it comes to, to chief and uh, just sheer impact on, on, on your ropes on and the, the gear, on yeah. the gear. And the so you're going to think a lot about your points of attachment. You want as many ropes as possible, but you also want as many points of attachment as possible. Yeah, and when you mean my point of attachment, either on the boat or also on land. 
uh, if you do stay on your boat you want to make sure you, you can adjust your ropes from the boat and not from land because if the surge comes up uh, that will snap your ropes or take your boat under I mean so we wanted to be able to make sure we can let the lines out as the boat climbs up, climbs up. And yeah, it, what if your boat is tied down in a complete spider web and you're nice and safe and cozy, but the surge goes up 10 feet, 20 feet, I mean, then you're just breaking points of attachment on your boat or the boat, you're, you're sinking your boat or you're breaking the dock, pile, the pilings of the dock or like all sorts of disasters. You, you need to be able to adjust the points of attachment. And how do we decide whether we were going to stay on the boat or not? I mean, I still don't know how to answer that question. I stayed with the, on the boat with you uh, the other night, but I didn't stay on the boat before. I still don't know. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with the category of hurricane that's expected. I, I yeah. would not stay on my boat. I think personally I would not stay on my boat beyond a category two. Like if we were hearing that there's going to be a category three hurricane, there's amount of wind speed that I wouldn't be able to exit the boat safely without flying away. Like, yeah, she weighs a lot less than I do. <laughs> I can probably handle a category three or four. I weigh a lot more than she does. At some point you lose control of the tools that you have at hand. So yes, you want to be able to adjust the ropes on your boat to keep your boat safe. You want to be able to uh, make sure bilge pumps are working and wa water isn't flowing into your boat, but you also don't want to put your life at risk. Didn't feel like that the other night in a category one. It didn't, there was no safety issue whatsoever. I could imagine that if the wind speed was double of what it was, I would start thinking about, yeah, my boat is not worth my life at all. Um, you, you just, you could, you wouldn't be able to do anything. I mean, if, if the wind speed is, yeah, at what point, is at high what enough, point the can you physically make a difference to what happens? I mean, I, I mean, there's a reason why in a category three hurricane you hear about places being evacuated and, and things like that. It's because even in a house, in a, in, a, in a building on land, they can't control factors. You can't control whether the building's gonna fly away or not. You have to make that decision. And personally, I just feel like that decision was I kind of have a clearer view of what it is, but I still don't know exactly. But definitely category one the other night, it's a matter of safely tying down your boat and putting where you're wanting, minimizing up, wind damage. Gathering up your stuff. Yeah, uh, make it, battening down hatches. That's that's what you can do. Find a safe place for the dinghy. I mean, the usual. Have the least amount of windage as possible. So we don't have solar panels up. We don't have anything. The 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 main furls into the mast and we don't have a foresail on the boat right now. Something else we considered is if we knew a category three was coming we would do everything in our power to put down the mast. That's the only thing that was getting hit by wind the other night. We yeah. were blocked by we, houses We were not and moving, mangrove. we were not jerking. The only thing is that every time we got hit by a gust the boat would just bend over uh, until a certain point. Finally the, the wind angle changed and we got hit more face on. Yeah. And though it was howling and blowing and, and screaming, we had no issues. Do we want to say like, well, when we saw the bigger hurricanes in the Caribbean in the past years? Yeah, basically if, if you look at the main common factor about boat damage and in most areas I get hit pretty hard, especially in the Caribbean with Irma, is that the biggest damage done to most sailboats was, was the mast. What caused issue, what caused boat dominoes effect to start and what caused major initial damages was having their mast up. It's just such a high point of windage, it just creates... I mean, most people who sail a multi-hull will, will tell you that we, we know with 50 knots, 60 knots of wind, even if you don't have any sail, the boat still does 10 knots, you know, especially yeah. depending on some angles of wind, I mean... This is my first experience of, of living in the tropics and, and having my boat and, and trying to keep it safe so often. Like, when we were in the Pacific, we weren't doing this every week. We weren't preparing for a hurricane. So this has been quite an experience. Once again, we were lucky that the amount of precipitation was less than forecast, and the wind speeds did not grow unexpectedly stronger as the hurricane made landfall. Choco and our neighbor's cat emerged from our boats, ready for a walk. As usual now, we made our way through the neighborhood to check on the damages and to collect the fruit of the storm, like coconuts and papaya. Sometimes the storm provides. 
Samtam. 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 They're not very strong rooted here. There are some poor captive dolphins here in the neighborhood, and after several past storm surges, apparently some were able to jump the gates and escape to the ocean, but not this time, as they placed temporary higher netting around them. Boats and ferries from Cozumel Island and north of here would also remain captive in the harbor until the sea would calm down about 24 hours later.